sometimes do guest spots with Frag, um, which include feather dusting, the band members or doing phone sex. You never stepped on stage into the guest spot? Oh, I did actually to um, organised a big gospel number. It was great. It broke down into this huge gospel thing and I'd, I'd jump up with Rana, the bass player. My band was playing too at the time and we were sort of a pretty similar theme. We were pretty crazy. I used to dress up as Love Shark. And they saw that I was pretty crazy because I used to get pretty crazy in the audience. And one day they asked me to step up on stage and finish the rest of the song. And that's sort of how it got started from there. It actually came about because I was doing a gig for Friedman uh, on the Lansdowne on New Year's Eve. And he gave me this tape and he said, oh, this other band, Frag, they want to do the show with us and, uh, and they haven't got a drummer, the drummer's left. And I said, oh, yeah, you want to do two gigs and one night? I thought, oh, sounds like a good idea. So they gave me this tape and I remember getting the tape and playing it and just going, this is the most god-awful sound I've ever heard, straight up. And I thought, but there's something that just is dragging you into doing it. A hell of a lot of bands back then, but there weren't, weren't anything that was as as visual as us and we weren't particularly good musicians but we we're keen to have a go at everything you know and and we'd be mixing things up like mixing disco and and rock and funk and things and then throwing in bits of country or whatever we, we had a real mishmash going on and i thought yeah we'd, we'd do well but we could never make a decent record it was the problem we were a good live band but as far as recordings we were, we were terrible we just never make good records Frag finished up and it was about six years before Machine Gun Flower Show did its first live performance. I'd like to find out about a song I heard last night at a disco party and it goes something like this. I've got to play chit chat telling fibs. What uh, sort of fibs? What sort of fibs did you tell? Pretty much all of them. We're musicians? Basically, we, basically <laughs> yeah. we realised from an early point that what we needed to do was just start a fight for us and you know being who we were and having band name like we do and the songs like we did it was very hard to create a fight yeah we have sort of got stuck with a bitch slap in the end yeah <laughs> when we um put out the first ep we sold in 700 copies of it because everyone looked at me and thought what the fuck are you doing with the band like machine gun fellatio everyone else had taken out these big lunches and, and they really just throwing money at us to try and get us. It was, I don't know how many meetings we did, but they were just like, oh, we want to change this, we want to change that. And, and then we'd, we'd go away drunk and eating these big meals. And he turned up and we sat in this cafe and he turned up, walked in and said, right, I've got five minutes, I love your album. I'm going to make the world, everyone across the road to you. I think Motherfucker is the first single. I signed Regurgitator for, I sucked a lot of cock to get where I am. You know I'm your man. I'm going to play it to James this afternoon, James Murdoch. <laughs> and he just walked out, got up, and we had to pay for his bloody coffee and lunch. Well, how many bands, how many bands out there are going to call themselves Machine Gun Fellatio, you know? You know what I mean? It's like, it was irreverent, and, you know, I'm a fan of that kind of stuff. When we signed the second deal, we said, we're not going to sign it unless we get Love Shark cutouts. <laughs> you know, that was clause 22 of the contract. That was very, very important to have that. And that was the only point we wouldn't negotiate. How long did it take for them to actually come up with that? Uh, they were actually late. It took them a month. We could have walked with the advance because they didn't. They had to hand cut them, them, which was nice. You want to sign a band who's got a vision for themselves, and, and those guys had a vision for themselves, full stop, you know, I was like, I'm impressed, you know. It was the booking thing that was more of an amazing thing to me at the time, because we never played live, and suddenly we had this <laughs> reputation as the best live band in Australia, and, and we were, it just happened to be all in our own heads. Mm. Um, it, uh, it went downhill once we actually started playing live. But God, we're good before we started. We've done some shows in Sydney, and they've been quite good shows. You know, we were quite comfortable playing live. We knew we were doing the right thing. Uh, but the first time we played in Melbourne was the first time that we'd actually played in front of the record label, our publishing company, who'd signed us on the same day, as well as our booking agent, who'd pretty much signed up with recently as well. So there's three organisations who'd never seen us live and committed themselves to us. And it was possibly the worst show that we've ever played. It was just completely awful. Everything that could have gone wrong went, went wrong. Um, I was horrified. I remember uh, just looking at them going, what the, f if I, what the fuck have I done? You know, this is really fucking bad cabaret. Um, but then I kind of like, you know, as every a guy does, I looked around the audience, you know, and people were actually like talking and it, they're like talking about it and enjoying it. I, like then we played the punters the next night and you could see they were starting to relax but I've never heard so many people say it was fine <laughs> we came off stage and they all said oh that was fine 
Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, mate. Yeah, I thought no, it was fine. Yeah. I was a very bad keyboard player for a couple of dodgy bands, and suddenly I was fronting this thing, and we had the Primus National Tour, and I was a lead singer, and I couldn't sing, I couldn't lead. I'm convinced that we were onto a very good thing, <laughs> very good thing, when we got such a negative response from the Primus audience. We got on stage at the Theberton Theatre in Adelaide, which held about, I think, uh, 2,000 people. It was packed. And they just started saying, yelling out, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. And we're like, oh, they hate us. You know, we, we just got really freaked out. Uh, pretty intensive, because we were playing to an audience that wasn't there looking for a freak show. They were looking for a hardcore rock, you know. And there were lots of young blokes, and they just like, they want, you know, they want things delivered pretty fast, and they want it, you know, to be pretty cool, you know. We were fucked, they knew it, and they hated it. I must say, I kind of giggled in the wings because it just seemed so ludicrous, uh, but I did feel sorry for Pinky and Chit Chat and the boys out there <laughs> because as soon as they got out, they were just bombarded with ice, plastic cup. This was Chit Chat's fantasy. We're going to be a famous rock and roll band, and frankly, it wasn't working out. And you couldn't help, well I couldn't help but laugh because they'd be up there singing songs like I Dance Electric and trying to get on with the show. <laughs> Not quite proving they were not puss, but keeping their dandyism and showgirl up <laughs> I remember thinking maybe it's just an Adelaide thing. You know, in Sydney they're going to love us. In Sydney they fucking hated us ten times more. Uh, my part was easy because I came out and did Motherfucker on a Motorcycle, which was the one song of the entire set that some of them had heard of, um, and also got my tits out, which they absolutely adored. I got 850 million things thrown at me by a bunch of screaming, angry Primus fans, and Chit Chat will tell you that, no man, no man, that's their way of showing their appreciation. So I came out the second night in Sydney, and it was funny how my dress started to change too, because whereas in Adelaide I'd started with pyjamas and a beehive wig, I think by the end of the tour I ended up with a white singlet on and shorts, and scrawled on the white singlet was picky as a cunt. We found out that um, Primus have a website called Primusucks, Dot com and this is this whole yelling out this abuse is part of their show and we had no idea so when we came out the next show um, we're saying we're machine gun fallacia, Pink is saying we're machine gun fallacia and we're fucked and we started them off. That's when we first started working with a light show and from then on we realised that uh, yeah, to, to really cut it wide you've got to, yeah, you've got to go pretty hard and, and it really uh, did change the live show at that point.